So Genesis chapter 47. Just a brief recap from last week. Of course, um, he sends and, and, um, unto Israel to come into the land. And um, he tells them at the end of, of the chapter last week, saying, you know, when Pharaoh asks you, what you do, tell them that you're, you know, you deal with cattle and that you're shepherds and, and that, you know, that way we can give you this, this land of Goshen. So that's exactly what happens here in verse, or in, excuse me, in chapter 47. The whole family comes back, you know, he sends them away with all his wagons and stuff to bring everybody back in. So their household, all their substance, all their cattle, all their, you know, people, everyone in the household comes and um, comes into Egypt. And it says in verse number 1 of chapter 47, Then Joseph came and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brethren and their flocks and their herds and all that they have are come out of the land of Canaan. And behold, they are in the land of Goshen. So he's saying they're already there. He's telling Pharaoh that they're all here. And um, it says in verse 2, And he took some of his brethren, even five men, and presented them unto Pharaoh. So he takes five of his, of his brothers or his brother's sons um, and he brings them unto Pharaoh. He doesn't bring the whole group, obviously. It says in verse 3, And Pharaoh said unto his brethren, What is your occupation? And they said unto Pharaoh, Thy servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. So they answer him according to, to the way Joseph had instructed them. The answer he said, Look, we're shepherds. And uh, it says in verse 4, They said, Moreover unto Pharaoh, For to sojourn in the land are we come. Of course, sojourn just means they want to stay there temporarily. It's not like they're, they're, they're moving in and that's going to be their home forever. They said, We just need to stay here at least during the famine. You know, we're just going to sojourn in this land. Because um, they weren't native to that land. They didn't want to just stay there. So they're asking the sojourn in the land of Egypt. And they say, continuing on, verse 4, For thy servants have no pasture for their flocks. For the famine is sore in the land of Canaan. Now therefore we pray thee, let thy servants dwell in the land of Goshen. So they're saying, look, you know, in Canaan we don't have any food. Our flocks can't even eat anything because the ground is all dried up. You know, this famine's been going on for years. There's nothing for them to eat. So we're asking, can you please just put us in the land of Goshen? Because apparently, you know, they're, they're still well watered and, and they're taking care of stuff in that area. Um, for, there's food available for the, for the flock to be able to eat. Um, whether it be the corn that they have laid up or whatever it is. But they asked to, to you know, it's, it's all according to Joseph's word. So they're doing everything that they were, they were told to do. In verse 5, And Pharaoh spake unto Joseph, saying, Thy father and thy brethren are come unto thee. The land of Egypt is before thee. In the best of the land, make thy father and thy brethren to dwell. So Pharaoh's being really nice, really hospitable, of course. I mean, he's impressed with Joseph. Joseph has been nothing but good unto Pharaoh. He's, he's increased his wealth. He's done all kinds of great things. You know, Pharaoh is just enamored by Joseph. And it was a wise decision of Pharaoh to put him in charge of everything because Joseph is maintaining all the people so they don't starve during the time of famine. And, he's, and, and Pharaoh obviously sees the wisdom in Joseph. So he's kind of rewarding him and rewarding his family and saying, you know what? You guys are welcome here. We're going to come. We're going to set you up in the best place. And I want you just to stay here. Don't worry about anything. We're going to take care of you. This is the attitude that Pharaoh has towards them. And it's, uh, he says, in the land of Goshen, let them dwell. And look, at I, I like this, this phrase here. There's so much content in this chapter, it's going to be difficult to try to focus on a few points. There are so many things we could preach and so many things we could learn. So let's pay real close attention to all this stuff And because I, I, I won't be able to go too far into detail over any one point if I want to try to get to all of them. He says at the end of verse 6, and he says, And if thou knowest any men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. So here he's saying, okay, the, you know, men of that, what's a man of activity? It means someone who's busy, right? If you're active, you're a man of activity, you're doing a lot of things. And this is kind of a rule that, that especially men you need to live by, but men and women, you know, we ought to be people of activity. We ought not to be lazy and slothful and someone who's just like, you know, you know the people that's, well, I'm just here to get paid. They show up to work and it's like, it's just a job and I'm just here to get my paycheck and you're counting the minutes down until you can just leave and everything is, just, you know, you don't care about being there. You don't care about the company you work for. You don't care about doing a good job. You know, you're doing just the bare minimum just to get by. Well, I have to do this. You know, there's a lot of people out there like that. We ought to be men of activity because, you know, the man of activity is going to be the one who gets the opportunities. 
Pharaoh says right here, hey, if you know anyone that's a man of activity, you know, someone who's real diligent about their work and is a hard worker and, and cares and, you know, and is constantly busy doing things, that's the person I want watching over my cattle too. He's going to increase their business and, and help them out even more because he's going to say, yeah, I want, I want them watching over my stuff. They're people of activity. They're getting things done. I mean, you're a man of activity. You're getting things done. You know, life isn't all about just, just taking it in, you know, relaxing by the beach and just doing nothing, getting nothing accomplished. If you want to get things accomplished, you need to be a man of activity. And especially if you're, if you're looking for that promotion at work and if you're trying to improve yourself and improve your skills, God will find a way to bless you and even other people, even without God's, you know, direct, supernatural, miraculous blessing, as a result of, of you just working hard, people will pay attention to that. People will notice that oftentimes people get offered jobs from people outside of the company. I mean, just when someone realizes maybe a customer comes in, they have their own business and they see you and you're always working and you're always busy and maybe there's nowhere for you to, to advance in the company you're in, but people see the hard work and the diligence that you're giving and you giving it your all because you care about it, even though you may not be making a very high wage. When people see that, it makes an impression on them. And, and oftentimes you'll never know who a person has that has more authority, or that has more power, maybe owns their own business or own multiple businesses. And they say, you know what? I see something in this guy and I want him to work for me. And before you know it, you could have someone like Pharaoh saying, well, yeah, make them rule over my stuff. I want them in charge of my stuff because I know that they're going to do a good job because they're not just lazy and, and you know, um, not caring about their work, but they're doing a good job. And so here he points out and just says, look, if you know any men of activity, that's who I want to, to rule over my, my cattle. Let's keep reading here. Verse number seven. And Joseph brought in Jacob, his father, and set him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. So this is pretty interesting too. You know, Pharaoh, Jacob finally comes. Joseph's father comes down and he has this meeting with Pharaoh. He meets him and he blesses Pharaoh. And it says in verse 8, And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, How old art thou? And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are an hundred and thirty years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. So Pharaoh sees Jacob. He's like, how old are you? He's, he's 130 years old. Now that's pretty old. And you know, this was old in those days. But you have to remember, in, in these days, this is after the flood, of course, and people started to, you know, the, the lifespan of, of people started to dwindle, started to go down and settle in around that, you know, 80 to 100 years as being an old man. You could even see, you know, and see in the book of Psalms, it talks about being an old man and you know, making it to 70 or 80 years old as being older. But here Jacob is really old. But um, of course, his predecessors lived to be even longer. You know, Abraham, Isaac lived to very, very long lives. And um, He's saying, you know, basically, he's 130 years old, saying few have been, you know, few and evil have been the years of my life. And he calls it his pilgrimage. And as a poor, too, you know, he considered himself a pilgrim on this planet. He doesn't make this earth his home. That he has, he has his sights set on an enduring place, on, on a habitation in heaven, not on what's on this earth. And we all ought to have this type of an attitude about our lives. You know, the life that we spend here on this earth right now, we're just pilgrims. This isn't our permanent dwelling place. This isn't what we care so much about and that we want to work to build up our great palaces and our wealth and everything else on this world as if this is the only thing that, that exists and matters. No, we're only passing through here for a short period of time. We need to be focused on our home that's in heaven, on the enduring home, on the everlasting home, the home that matters, the home where you're going to be spending your time. I mean, think about it. Like, even just, just naturally speaking, if you were to have a, you know, a summer home and then your regular residence, right? Somewhere, maybe a vacation home. You own a property. You're going to be investing a lot more of your time and resources into the place where you stay all the time you know, if, if, if two, if, if both places are falling in disrepair and need, and need work done, 
what's going to happen? You're going to spend more of the time and effort on the, the place that you actually, you know, if we have a rental property, right? It's not a vacation home. We're not rich or anything. The only way we're able to move up here was through that rental property. So when work needs to be done, obviously we need to maintain our rental property, but the, the, the main focus is going to be where we live and where we dwell. Well, likewise, we need to recognize that even where we live now and where we dwell here on the earth, we're just pilgrims. You know, this isn't our home. The world is not our home. Heaven is our home. And we need to be focused on that and living um, in a way that would, that would make sense where we're earning rewards for ourselves in heaven. Now, in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 7, the Bible says, And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. So you might look at this and be like, wow, you know, Jacob gets to meet Pharaoh. You know, the big Pharaoh, the guy that's in charge of everything. You know, the king over this, this whole domain. He's got this great realm and he has so much power. And it's, I mean, it's Pharaoh, right? Jacob was better than Pharaoh. Okay. And it, it's proven just in the fact that Jacob is the one blessing Pharaoh. The Bible says that the, without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. Jacob was definitely the better. I mean, Pharaoh's in the world. Who cares that he has this stupid position of power? That means nothing. Jacob was a man of God. He was a great man of God and obeyed God. And he was um, definitely the better in that sense. And he was blessing Pharaoh. And... Um, of course, Pharaoh had been good to Joseph, right? Pharaoh treated Joseph well. And we don't see Pharaoh doing anything like real bad here, but he, I mean, he's still of the world. He's still just over land of Egypt. And what we're going to see in this chapter, because there's a lot of things to learn here, a lot of important lessons to learn. But this is where we see Joseph kind of doing, I alluded to this last week, Joseph doing some, some things he shouldn't have been doing. And, um, you know, he had all of the authority that he could possibly need or want from Pharaoh. So when Joseph ends up basically stealing from the people in order to, for them to continue to survive, because Joseph's in this position of, of total power. With the famine that's going on, and he knows it's going to continue to go on. He knows it's not over yet. And he sees when the money fails in the land, which is we're going to get to that here in this chapter. We already read the whole thing. We saw the money failed. Now, when money fails, it means it's useless. It's pointless. It's not, what are you going to do with it? Pharaoh had so many. You know, everybody was giving all of their money unto Pharaoh to buy food that it became meaningless and useless. What are you going to do with money? It means nothing. People just needed food. They needed to survive. Money became, and, and besides that, Pharaoh had all of it. So the little pieces of money they had, people had left were meaningless. It, it wasn't going to, it had no purchasing power. And, I mean, really, the, you know, when Pharaoh has all of the wealth, it's, it becomes pretty meaningless. What are you going to do with that? People aren't interested in getting money for anything. They want, they want food, right? So Pharaoh's, I mean, even for Pharaoh, I mean, holding on to this big lump sum of money, what is he going to do with that? Nobody cares to have, it's no more, it's no longer valuable to people. Now, once the famine's over and, and the economy gets back on its feet again, of course, that's going to be tremendously wealthy, wealthy to Pharaoh because um, things will recover. People will start actually earning and, and, and increasing and being able to, to you know, use uh, money again and, and make other transactions. But, um, and then at that point, Pharaoh's going to be sitting on, on everything you know, and have total power, which he already has now. And you think about the power that's involved. You know, you could, people these days, you can have a lot of money, which, you know, you're going to have some power associated with that. But as long as there's still independence in people, as long as you're still able to do things on your own, you only have so much power. You, you know, right now, people are, can have the option of being self-sufficient. You don't have to, you know, be dependent on anybody necessarily. But in this situation, with the famine being so sore and people not being prepared and, and, and needing to survive, obviously you need to eat in order to live. The people needed this. You know, you get to the point, you start taking everything away. When, you know, the person that controls the food supply can control the whole population. And that's what happened here. Joseph controlled the entire food source because nobody else was able to, to um, grow any crops. There was a famine. And this is the way that monopolies work, right? This is why there's these antitrust laws and stuff in, in, the, in, the, in the government. But, um, you know, 
especially when it comes to something like food, like something you have to live by, and one person is control of everything, then you can do basically whatever you want. You have total control over the people, and the people are willing to do anything for it, which is what we see. So they start off giving all their money. Say, okay, well, whatever. You can have all of our money. Well, the famine continued. Now they don't have any money, and they're going to Pharaoh saying, look, we need to eat. You know, why aren't you going to feed us here? You know, we need something. And money's not going to cut it. So Joseph says, okay, money failed. Well, why don't you give me your cattle? You still have stuff of value. It doesn't have to be physical money. Give me your cattle. Give me your asses. Give me all those animals that you have that, that you work with. And now what's he doing? Any hope that they might have of being able to, to earn money or, or, or do better for themselves, he's taken that away from them also. Right? He's taken away any opportunity they might have in order to improve their situation. And they're like, fine, you know, whatever. Well, if it comes down to having to give you our cattle and, and survive and eat or not give you our cattle and, and die from the famine, then we'll give you our cattle. So they do that. And of course, that lasted for that year. Then the next year, they're like, what else do we have? You have everything. You have our money. You have our goods. All that's left is us and our land. And see, at that time, they still owned their property. They, at least they had their land. And at the very end, they, they, they say, fine. They said, what good is our land going to do us if we die? So they sold themselves into slavery, into bondage, and their land. That, so that basically, Pharaoh owned everything. All, there is no more private property except for the priests. There was the one exception was that, that they didn't take, you know, the priests had a special position that Pharaoh was going to still take care of them. Whereas the rest of the people, they had to sell their lands and now all of a sudden Pharaoh owns all of their land and they work and essentially they work for Pharaoh and they're going to be allowed to keep a little bit back for themselves but Pharaoh determines what that amount is since he owns everything else. Now, What's not right about all this, this situation is that how did they even get that food to begin with? Joseph taxed them every year in the good years. And they had to pay one-fifth of, of their increase to the government in order for him to, to store the food in order to keep everybody alive. Now, that, that food belonged to them. It was rightfully theirs. And, and you could say, well, it, it had to be done, right? It had to be done in order for everyone to survive. Okay, but the right thing to do wouldn't have been to sell their food back to them. It would have been to say, okay, we did this in order for you to continue to survive because we knew this famine was coming. And we prepared and got ready and built these storehouses so that way everybody can survive in this land. Well, you paid into it for seven years, so here we go. We're going to pay you back for seven years. And now you'll be, we're going to ration it out, but everyone's going to make it through this. That would have been the right thing to do because it belonged to them in the first place. You know, it's a taxing them on the way in and then taxing them on the way out. It's like, you know, supposedly we have this social security, right? Where the, the government takes money out of your paycheck and says, basically, you don't know how to take care of yourself because you're just stupid people and we pay for, for all these other resources and welfare and everything else and we don't want to do that when you get older so we're going to just take this money out of your paycheck and we're going to put it in a bank account over here and then when you get old enough then, then and you didn't because you're too stupid you didn't prepare for, for yourself getting older then you'll have this money here and you'll get it back and the way it's supposed to work is that you know, however much you put in is, is what you'll end up getting back. And of course, you don't get back nearly what you could have made with that money had you just kept it yourself and invested it and do your own things. But that's a whole other point. That's besides the point. But what they did here is, let's say now, they say, oh, okay, you know, you get to, you get to your old age, you're not making any money, and you're going, okay, well, you've been collecting all of my money into Social Security, you know, now, you know, I need it. I need to live. I, need, I don't have any more income, right? I'm old. I'm too old to work. I can't do anything. Uh, you know, I, I need help. And if you were to go to the government and they were to say, okay, we'll, we'll help you out. We'll help you get through your, your old age, but uh, now you have to start paying taxes and, oh, you don't have any money because you don't have a job? Well, start selling the things that you have. 
right, and give that to us. And we'll keep feeding you, we'll keep giving you this paycheck, your Social Security check, but you need to keep on, you know, giving to us until it got to the point to where the house that you'd bought for, you know, your 30-year mortgage on, it's all paid off and everything that you have basically just belongs. If, if the government were to do that today and just be like, they own everything, this is similar to what Joseph did with the corn in the land of Egypt in order to sustain it. It's like, you already paid into that. Why are they charging you now just to get it back what they've already taken from you? They've stolen it from you and now they're charging you for it. I mean, even a, a more clear example would just be to, you know, if I, if I went to Brother Sebastian and I just stole something of his and then I was like, oh, you want this back? Okay, well, what are you going to give me for it? You know, and I said, charge you full price for, for what you just, what I just took from you. That's what really happened here. And that's what government does. And, you know, there's a lot of lessons to be learned here, though. One of it is, is don't rely on the government to help you. Because the more power that's involved, the more corrupt it gets. And the more they saw, I mean, it, couldn't they have been happy with all of the money in the land? And just said, well, we have all of the money. We have all the wealth. Well, let's at least let the people keep their cattle so that when the famine ends, they can, still, they can still be productive. They can still do things. They can still get back on their feet and work their way out of this. But that wasn't good enough. The greed set in and, and they said, nope, nope, now we're going to charge you for this. Nope, now we're going to keep on charging you. Just give me all that you have. And that, and that power just corrupted. Because what is, what is Pharaoh going to do with it all anyways? What does he need all that money for? What, I mean, literally, like all of the money in the land. What does he need all of the cattle for? You could only do so much with your money and your wealth. I mean, literally, there's only so much you can do. There is a limit to what you can possibly do in this lifetime with money and wealth. And, and he had an abundance way surpassing anything he could possibly imagine what he wanted to do. But they continued to just take and take and take from the people. And, you know, honestly, what I believe is that this is one of the factors that is involved with why the children of Israel then went into bondage. Because here... Notice, it's not Israel that's going into bondage. They're being taken care of. They're not selling all of their goods. So during this famine, the children of Israel are doing just fine. But Joseph is the one that's responsible for putting the, the people of Egypt into bondage. Just as his brothers were responsible for putting him into bondage and selling him off as a slave, now he apparently didn't learn enough from that experience He's putting the, children, the people of Egypt, as if he doesn't care about them at all, he's putting them into the bondage of Pharaoh. And that's going to turn around. And I believe because he did that, that's one of the reasons why the children of Israel then suffered for so long. I'm not saying that's the only reason why, but I think that had a big influence on them being put under hard bondage then. Because Joseph is literally the one that sold the children of Egypt into bondage. And you can't blame that on Pharaoh. Pharaoh's not the one that said... No, 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 you, you know, I want their money, I want their cattle, I want this. Joseph had full authority over dealing with this whole thing. Pharaoh said from the beginning, hey, whatever Joseph says, that's what we're going to do. If Joseph thinks we should do it this way, then, then that's the way we're going to do it. And Joseph is the one who's leading. And, and notice, the people are coming to Joseph, and Joseph is the one that's answering. Nowhere do we see Pharaoh being the one that, that is the one dictating what's going to happen here. It's Joseph. And, um, and, you know, all throughout the, you know, these stories, we've seen Joseph is a very good, very great godly man and, and do it, you know, keeping his faith and doing good things and doing what's right. This is the sin we see in Joseph's life. We see him making the wrong choices and the wrong decisions and negatively impacting a lot of people. Now, he still saved their lives, but he didn't have to do things this way. So let's read through some of this here. Um, I kind of just did a full overview, but... Um, of what was going on here. Verse number 12, And Joseph nourished his father and his brethren and all his father's household with bread according to their family. So there we see the children of Israel being taken care of. They're not falling into bondage, selling everything that they own. They've got the land of Goshen, which is also called the land of Ramses. So we find out in this chapter that Ramses and Goshen is the same place. Um, it could be referred to th by either name. But that's where they're living and, and they're doing just fine. They're being sustained um, by Pharaoh and by Joseph. Verse 13, And there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. 
And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the corn which they bought, and Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said, See, they're coming unto Joseph. Give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence? They're saying, Look, give us some bread. Why is it that you would just let us sit here and die in your presence? You have all this food. Why would you just let us die? They're like, Give us some food. For the money faileth. We don't have any money. It's gone. It's no good anymore. Verse 16, And Joseph said, Give your cattle, and I will give you for your cattle if money fails. Say, oh, okay, you don't have any money? Give me, your good, give me your cattle. And that's what they did. And they brought, it says they brought, uh, Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses, for flocks, for cattle, herds, and for the asses. He fed them with bread for all their cattle for that year. So you can notice that he's only getting this for one year. He said, okay, your cattle for one year's worth of food. And that's it. And every year. And he knows. He knows. He knows that, you know what? They're giving me all their cattle and I'm only giving them one year of food and it's going to continue even more. So he has this, he has to have this plan in advance of what he's going to do because he knows they're going to be in the same exact situation next year. And that is a wicked plan of just of putting the entire population into slavery. That is a wicked plan. And that's what he did here. And he knew what he was doing. And to be honest with you, I believe that there are wicked people today that have this same plan. And you can call me nuts, you can call me conspiracy theory, whatever you want. There are wicked people in this world that, that have a tremendous amount of money and they have a tremendous amount of power, but that's not enough for them. See, once they get started, they want to keep getting more and more and more and more. It's a perverted way of thinking. But there are people out there, and I believe... It's all tied together with the food. And that's why we see the genetically modified foods. And ultimately, there's going to be only one people who are going to be in charge of all the food supply. Because what's going to happen with, the, you know, with a lot of these genetically modified foods, they don't reproduce. Like you, can't, you can't continue to use the seeds year after year. You can only use them that year, and then you have to get more. They, they don't produce their own seeds. And see, when they, when they start messing with the land and they have the chemicals and everything else that you have to use, the Roundup and everything else in order to get these crops to grow, makes it so that you can't grow normal crops. So now you're going to have people, you're going to have this, this, this massive uh, production of food by a select few people. No one else is going to be able to grow. It's going to be like a famine except you're going to have the few people that are in charge of the food supply and saying, okay, well, this is, we've got the food. You want it? What are you going to pay for it? What are you going to do for it? And try to enslave people. Food, food is an, a very good source for, for wicked people to try to enslave a population. And that's what we saw happen here. But let's keep reading here. It says in um, verse number 18, when that year was ended, they came unto him the second year and said unto him, we will not hide it from my Lord how that our money is spent. My Lord also hath our herds of cattle. That is, there is not aught. That means there's not anything left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our lands. Saying all that we have left is us and our land. That's it. I mean, you have everything else. Verse 10 or 19. Wherefore shall we die therefore, or excuse me, wherefore shall we die before thine eyes, both we and our land? By us and our land for bread and we and our land will be servants unto Pharaoh and give us seed that we may live and not die that the land be not desolate so you know one of the other things we learn well one of the things we learn is you know you don't want to trust the government in all of your safety nets and your and your you're helping you out through bad times because there's a lot of wicked people in government that don't really care about you and they waste money and, and everything else but not just that. So if we can't rely on government, what do we rely on? Well, one, we need to rely on God, obviously. We know that God will get us through any time and that we don't need to get fearful and get scared about famines, about things that happen, but that we can rely on God. We shouldn't let that scare us. But at the same time, while we're relying on God, we ought to be able to rely in, to some degree on ourselves also. And what I mean by itself is just that in, you know, so that we're not relying on a government or another entity other than God and our own hard work in order to get us through things. And we need to be wise. We need to be able to look at the signs of the times. We ought to be able to look at the things and say, and be wise with what we have 
knowing that, as I mentioned last week, you know, our currency, our debt, the, the debt in this country is just is, is like insurmountable. The amount of spending that's going on, the money will fail. And when the money fails, there's going to be a lot of other problems with that economic collapse that's going to happen as a result. And, you know, it's very likely that the, the food shell, you know, the, the grocery store shelves are going to go bare with people freaking out and getting into panic mode because they didn't prepare and they're not ready for this type of a thing. And, you know, you could say, oh, that's just a doomsdayer and you know, all this other stuff. It's just using wisdom. And I'm not saying this to scare you. I don't think we should be living our life in fear. And look, I get it. I don't have a tremendous amount of money. And most people I know don't have a tremendous amount of money. So I'm not saying that you need to be so worried and fretful over this that if you don't have very much money, because look, I know ultimately that God can get us through. I mean, God did get his people through. He got the children of Israel through, which he would have done, um, which he did do. And he made sure that they made it through. And um, they made it through just fine. God was looking out for them. And he'll do the same for you too. But we ought to be able to show some wisdom and, and be able to prepare for something when you know there's going to be bad times ahead. It's, it's, it's you know, irrefutable. You can't... Uh, <clears throat> the, the, the house of cards can only last for so long before it gets knocked down. And, and the, the, the sham of our, our <clears throat> economy of this, of this country and the, the debt that we're running up, it could only last for so long. And there will be hard times to come when the, when the dollar fails and, and when um, you know, the chickens come home to roost. It's, it's going to be not pleasant times here. So what can we do is just look at that and say, okay, well, I'm going to start to be a little bit prepared for this, something like that. And, you know, being prepared is, is good anyways. I mentioned this before, um, previously, a couple weeks ago on, the, on our sermons in Genesis. Joseph prepared when he knew that the hard times were coming. We ought to prepare also. You never know when you might lose your job or even other things that have nothing to do with the, the total government collapse. It's a good idea just to have some extra food and extra water and things staved up in order to get you through your own hard times. That's just a wise thing to do. But um, we he see here these people, because you definitely don't want to be going into slavery, right? I mean, these people, they had nothing left, and they're like, well, all I can do is just offer up myself. Now look at what he does. It says, um, Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh in verse number 20. He bought it for Pharaoh. He gave it to Pharaoh. It's not like Joseph was collecting all that stuff, but he still did it in Pharaoh's name. He did it for Pharaoh. He bought up all the land of Egypt, for the Egyptians sold every man his field, because the famine prevailed over them. So the land became Pharaoh's. Now they're in a really bad situation because they don't even own their own land. They can't even go to their own home in their own land and be like, well, at least I have this. And they didn't own it, but he still let them live there. But look what it says in verse 21. It says, And as for the people, so the people that sold their land and all this stuff, it says, He removed them to cities from one end of the borders of Egypt even to the other end thereof. And notice, this is, this is going on today. The liberal agenda, the, this, um, the, the New World Order agenda is trying to move the population into cities into these small clusters and cities. And what, uh, the way they're doing that now, they're trying to, trying to get you to believe that you know, the earth is overpopulated and they need to institute more levels of control in your life and tell you how many children you could have and tell you how much food you can consume and how much garbage you can produce and all this other stuff for the, for the sake of the environment. And they want to start making more and more and more areas of land belong unto the government, to the federal. You know, this is federal land. This is federally owned land. You can't build here. You can't cut down trees. You can't live here. You can't do anything because we need to conserve the environment. And what they do, they want you to move into cities. And people that live in cities, they're going to start looking around them in just their day-to-day -day life and start thinking, yeah, this is pretty populated. You, know, you, start to, you start to think and buy into that idea that the earth is overpopulated because you're spending all of your time in an apartment building or whatever and you're surrounded in a, in a dense city, dense metropolitan area where there's just a whole bunch of people compacted into that one space. And it's a lot easier to control people when you're compacted into one space. And when you don't own land, you don't have anything else, 
you know, what are you going to do? You just have, you become a slave. You just have to work. And you work for the government. You work for bureaucracy. You have to work for these different things. That um, obviously I'm all for working, but but when you don't own anything and you're you're in bondage under someone else, now you just become a slave and you're working for your master. And it, which in this case was Pharaoh. And what they what their plan was? Okay. We don't want these people on this land anymore because now it belongs to Pharaoh. You don't need as many people on the land. You could, you could, you could have more, you know, less people covering a larger area since it belongs to Pharaoh, right? You want to be efficient. So get the rest of those people out into the city, living, living close together and, um, and off of that land. So just, just bear this stuff and bear this wisdom in mind. Well, we see, you know, history repeats itself. We see these things happening back here with the food and, and their plan and their agenda and what they've done and moving the people in the cities. Pay attention to that and to what's going on today. They don't want people being independent. You're just like, you know, I've seen in the news people being fined for not being, not having their home as like part of the grid, of the power grid. Like it's like illegal. Like you can't do that in certain towns and in cities across America where you say, you know, all I want to do is just live in my land on my house without hooking up. You know, it's, and they're saying no. And it's this, this mentality of the government knows what's best for you. And ultimately, the government wanting to become God in your life. And these socialists and communists, that the state is their God. Because they think that the government needs to take care of everything and, and determine, make everything right and make everything wrong. And, you know, like, turn all the wrongs into rights and make sure everybody's equal and that there's, there's, everything is fair and that the government's responsible for that. Government run by wicked people. They somehow, they think, is magically going to do all this stuff. It's because they don't believe in God and they don't believe in the power of God, that God is the revenger, that God is able to make the wrongs right again and God is able to get people through their tough times and that we don't need to rely on a government system and you don't need to steal from Peter to pay Paul. You don't need to steal from one person who's, who's actually a man of activity and doing good things and making money in order to pay for someone who doesn't want to work. Now look, if that person who can't work is, is you know, a godly person, God will take care of them and there's no problem with that. But if they're not and they're just lazy, you know, why should anyone take care of them? They need to, you know, the Bible teaches that if any man shall not work, neither shall he eat. If you have the means of working and you just don't do it because you don't want to, then you shouldn't eat. And no government program should be around to take care of a person like that. Because that just promotes bad behavior. Why would that person ever do anything? And that's what we see now. It's what our welfare, welfare system is all about. is just giving more and more money to people who don't want to find a job. And it's a, it's a failure. And, it's, and it's, uh, it's wicked. Let's keep reading here. Verse number... Um, so they sell themselves and their land. They become slaves, basically, under Pharaoh. And they move them into the cities. Verse 22, only the land of the priests bought he not. So he explains here how the priests, no, they're special. You know, they, Pharaoh will apportion them their, their, um, their food, and they get to keep their lands. Verse 23, then Joseph said unto the people, Behold, I have bought you this day and your land for Pharaoh. Lo, here is seed for you, and ye shall sow the land. So now he's putting them to work. He's saying, okay. Okay, you belong to Pharaoh now, and here's, I, I'm giving you the seed so you can eat and live, and now go work the land and produce. Verse 24, and it shall come to pass in the increase that ye shall give the fifth part unto Pharaoh, and four parts shall be your own for seed of the field and for your food and for them of your households and for food for your little ones. So now he's just basically putting in, instituting a tax, 20%. So you got to pay 20% tax basically for the rest of your lives because we're going to keep you alive. We're giving you this food. You go work the land. Hey, we're going to let you keep 80% to yourself. It's only 20% you've got to give to Pharaoh. But look at that. I mean, 20%. How much does Pharaoh need? God only gets 10% in our tithe. 10 per, look, in the word, he's saying of their increase, right? He says in verse 24, and I'll read it again, and it shall come to pass in the increase. So in their increase, when they're getting, you know, when, when they increase their goods, when they increase their crops, Pharaoh gets 20% of that. God only gets 10% of your increase. And see, this is that replacing the government with God and, and saying, nope, we're going to, you know, Pharaoh needs even more. You're going to give him 20%. And be, be glad about that or else we'll make it 50% or 60%. You know, and that's, when, when the government owns everything, what's to stop them from making, you know, they make up any rules they want. 
when you're not truly free, when you're just under bondage, you're a slave. And you know, that's kind of the way it feels like today. And people will be like, oh, we're not slaves. You know, we're the land of the free. Are we really, though? When I earn my, my wage, when I work for somebody that, that's willing to pay me to do a job, and money is just extracted from my child, I have no say in that. And they just take money out and just say, nope, we're keeping this. It's only this percent. Yeah, you guys can vote on it. You can vote on a percent, and sometimes you can't even vote. How is that freedom? How is that not bondage? It's like, and, and, and my property, right? You can't own the property without paying taxes on it. If I have to pay taxes, then who really owns it? If I truly owned it, then I think I would be the one that could dictate who needs to pay taxes to me for use of my land. If the government's the one saying, oh yeah, you think you own this land, but you, know, you have to kick back a certain percentage every year in order to keep that land. And if you don't pay it, we're going to come and get men with guns to show up at your house and they're going to lock you up in a cage and we're going to take what you have. Test it out. See it. See if you don't pay your taxes on a land that you fully own, that you bought outright with your own hard-earned money. You think you own your land and your property. Try stop paying your taxes on that. See what happens. And then we'll see who's truly in charge. If you really own that land or if the government really owns it. When someone can, can in, impose a tax on you, that means they're the ones that, that own it, not you. <laughs> Fifth part, that's 20%. That's what they were given to Pharaoh. Twice as much as, as what God requires of us. Verse number... Um, and they're happy about it, too. Notice this. They, they're happy to go into slavery. Look at verse 24. And it shall come to pass in the increase that you shall give the fifth part unto Pharaoh, and four parts shall be your own, for seed of the field, and for your food, and for them of your households, and for food for your little ones. And they said, Thou hast saved our lives. And they're just, they're just grateful. They've forgotten about the fact that they've just been taxed for all this anyways, and it belonged to them in the first place. Thou hast saved our lives. Let us find grace in the sight of my Lord and we will be Pharaoh's servants. They're happy to do it. Wow, you're even going to give us 80% to keep for ourselves? That's so nice of you. But this is the way they work. They make it, they make it look like they're doing them a favor. And that's what the government always wants to do because if they realized what was going on, there'd be a revolt. And they'd go in and take the take their own food back. No, this is ours. We're taking it back. We're almost done here. Let's finish up this chapter. There's so much that could be said about this and so much wisdom we can learn from this story. Verse number 26, And Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt unto this day. So this is something he instituted now. I mean, that famine lasted for seven years. And as a result of that, that law just got passed and he just says, boom, Pharaoh gets the fifth part. I mean, and that just goes on and on and on. Now, is that even fair? It's like, okay, well, we took care of you. We did all this stuff for you. And, you know, we took care of you for these seven years. So now forever, your children, your children's children, they're always going to be in bondage under Pharaoh. Just, that's the law. It's a new law of the land. It's wicked. It says, And Joseph made a law over the land of Egypt unto this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth part except the land of the priests only, which became not Pharaoh's. And, it, and like, that's an incentive, right? To be a, to be a priest of, the, of that wicked, false religion. Be a, be a priest and you don't have to pay your taxes. You don't have to pay taxes, right? Um, promote the, the, the wicked, false god that, uh, that Pharaoh worshipped. Verse 27, And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions therein, and grew and multiplied exceedingly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the whole age of Jacob was 140 and 7 years. And the time drew nigh that Israel must die. And he called his son Joseph and said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt, but I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said. And he swear, and he said, Swear unto me. 
And he swore unto him, and Israel bowed himself upon the bed's head. So here we see Israel living up to 147 years old. Pretty old. And um, he's making this last request here with Joseph. And he says, and this is where we see him putting his hand under his thigh. And this is real interesting. Um, you remember Jacob was the one who wrestled with the angel. And he wrestled all night. And then he was the one that made his joint, you know, Jacob's joint came out of, out of socket. And, um, and the, the sinew in his thighs shrank. And now we see, and they, and they do this from here on forward, like as a, as a sign of when they make their vows and their promises and stuff, they put their hand on their thigh. And um, so now we see Jacob asking Joseph to do that. He's saying, wait, deal truly with me. You know, put your hand here and, um, and promise that you'll bury me not in Egypt. So I don't want to be buried in this land. I want to be buried with my fathers. And just real briefly, I'm going to, I'm going to touch on this point of burial as being a Christian thing to do. You know, I, I've preached an entire sermon about this in the past, but um, I believe that the Bible is, is pretty clear and teaches that, you know, we ought to be buried when we die. Now, obviously, once you're dead, there's nothing you can do about that. It's, and, and ultimately... It's not going to matter in, in, in the grand scheme of things. You know, if someone does something with your body after you're dead, there's nothing you can do about it. Well, whatever. But there's a few reasons why I believe we ought to be buried. I mean, we see here uh, Israel thought it was very serious. And he was, he, he, you know, I mean, this was a major thing for him. He said, look, make sure I get buried with my, with my fathers and not left here in Egypt. And um, see, the burial is important because it, it's, a, it's symbolic of our faith and of our resurrection. Just as you bury a plant, a seed in the earth, you know, you, in order for that, for that seed to, to get life and to grow and to come back again, once it's buried, it has to be buried first. You don't, you don't, you know, in order to produce fruit, in order to, to get a, a plant out of it, you can't just burn it and, and annihilate it and, and, you know, turn it into nothing, obviously. Um, cremate it, right? Our burial is a symbolism of, our, of us being planted in the earth as a seed because we know that the resurrection is going to happen in the future. We have faith in that. We know that it's going to happen. And it shows our faith in that resurrection of being planted into the ground as a seed to come up again later in the resurrection with a new body, with a glorified body, with a, you know, uh, um, this seed, this, this fleshly seed that gets planted in the earth is going to come back much better. And, um, you know, that's the, the symbolism that, that is involved with death and burial. So, you know, a lot of people maybe have never even thought about this before. You're like, I don't care, you know, I don't want to sp spend the money for, a, for a, a grave and, you know, you can just burn me up. But honestly, I think that um, the, the Christian thing to do, the biblical thing to do is to, is to get buried. Now, you don't have to have some fancy tomb or anything like that. But just the, the fact that you're getting buried is showing the... Uh, the, the, the coming of the resurrection and, and your faith in that. So it's a, it's a symbol that I believe that all Christians should follow and not just um, go the route of... Because of, what, what does a cremation show? I mean, to me, if anything, that's a symbol of like hell. Right? I mean, you're, you're going and just getting completely burned up and engulfed in flames. Um, we know that's not where, where our soul is. But, I mean, regardless of what happens to your body, like I said, you have no control over that. I mean, I don't think it's a sin for you after you're dead what people do with it. But um, I believe the Christian practice should be this burial. And we see that Jacob cared about that as well. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this chapter and for all that we can learn from it, dear God. I pray that you would please help us to, to learn to be more self-sufficient. And, um, and ultimately also, dear God, more, more importantly even than that is, is our reliance on you. And that we wouldn't um, get too fearful about, about times ahead or about troubles that, that we might face, dear Lord, but that we can just trust in you. And that, Lord, we would be people of activity, that we would not just waste the time that we have here and that we could continue to increase and abound and that you can use us to do even more good works, dear Lord, and that we would, um, we would be ever vigilant to do that which is right and to continue to work for you, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.